thank you. Good morning, is this one working? I'm working, awesome. This is interactive, you can't go to sleep, yay. So to start us off, I would like you to turn to someone you haven't met before, stand up, that's easy, okay? Everyone stand up. Pair up with someone you haven't met with much before, could be behind you, Shame. in front of I you, don't you don't you have to well. move. <laughs> or you don't have to move much. The minister spoke you can well. be threes. Awesome. And fabulous. So now, <laughs> to save me losing my voice, when I do jazz hands, can you all do jazz hands with me? Awesome. That's a signal for let's be quiet and we do this. Okay. I like that. And so now, what I'd like you and your partner to do is to each mime something that you did in the weekend to each other. So you, you're using your body language. Mime something you did in the weekend. Yep. I didn't fly the plane. I was a passenger in the plane. Soccer? No, I no, it's football. Well, what's the difference? American. Is it? American. Fantastic, that's simple, and now grab a seat. Oh. Oh. Hi, that's Emma. a great, grab a seat. Easy All right. start. Thank you, Shane. Football. Lovely. So now you're nicely warmed up. Throughout this entire conversation, you're going to be having small conversations with different neighbours, okay? Because this is interactive. We're kind of weird to talk about master and collaboration and have it just me doing a monologue to you. It would be weird. Um, so I'm Andrea Thompson. I co-founded Catapult with my husband 20 years ago. That's collaboration. How do we make that work, some people ask. How many of you think I could never work with my partner? There is no way, yeah. <laughs> We have separate offices, can I, can I clarify? <laughs> um, so here's what we're going to do today. So I've got the, got the great privilege of co-leading the Public Health Leadership Program. I lead a sustainability leadership program. I develop leadership development programs for private sector organisations, public sector, and have facilitated many complex, tricky collaborations over the last 20 years. What I thought I'd cover is these key things. What is collaboration? Why should we do it? Who should you do it with? What are the trolls waiting under the bridge? And what are some other relationship choices? And finally, how do we do it? And that's all in an hour. So I've got my stopwatch here. I have my stopwatch here. It's still alive. Okay, and then I'll explain who the, these two young creatures are at the end. First off, what is this thing called collaboration? And this might hint to how come it can be so tricky. The central challenge of collaboration is hidden in two different dictionary definitions, and there's a major tension between the two. The first is to work jointly with. That sounds nice, doesn't it? To work jointly with. I would like you to bring to mind a time, and it might have been when you were a child, might have been through sports or the arts, might have been in your family, community, or at work, when you collaborated with someone else and it was wonderful. It was wonderful. And can you please turn to a neighbour and tell a once upon the, a time story, quite short, hey, here was the situation, I worked, worked jointly with these people, it felt like this, so what was the mood, and what were you able to accomplish together in a nutshell? One minute each, you and your neighbour, ready, go. Which neighbour? Neighbour. This neighbour. Oh, yeah. I can't think of it. I think collaboration is quite nice when you're um, exercising, you know, if you're, you know, you're doing a big race like around Taupo or you collaborate as a team, you train together, you do the trip together, you do the K2 together. I kind of like that level of collaboration.
then finishing that up. Love to take a few key words from people. So uh, how did it feel, this example? Raise your hand, I'll just call on you and you shout out your word. How did it feel, this lovely, wonderful collaboration? Positive. It felt positive, thank you. What else, how did it feel? Fluid. Fluid, beautiful word. Energizing. Energizing, fantastic. Another couple? Strong. It felt strong, lovely. Productive. What else? It felt productive. What else? Felt supported, fantastic. And through that, you were able to accomplish wonderful things. Yes? And for some of you, some of those relationships are enduring. How many of you have collaborated with someone in the past and you've still got an enduring relationship with that person or that group? That's fantastic. And some of you are like, well, yeah, I'm still married to them. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, they are my children. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Next up, um, this reminds me of a lovely Fakatoki. Success is not the work of one, but the work of many. E hara takutoa, e te toa takatahi, engare he toa takatini. So we know at its best, collaboration can be absolutely delicious, can't it? It's divine. Let's now go to the other side. So we know one definition is to work jointly with. What's the other definition of collaboration? To co cooperate treacherously with the enemy. So if you think back to wartime, if you were a collaborator, was that a good thing? No, you were cooperating with the invader against your own people. So there's a big tension inside of collaboration because the challenge of collaboration is that sometimes we have to work jointly with people that we don't think we can agree with or even trust. Is that challenging? When we start thinking about the field of public health, are there enemies in the field of public health? <laughs> are there people you could easily think of as being against your cause? You violently disagree with them. They're for something else. And yet might you need to collaborate with them? Well, some people from public health say, no, I'm not going to collaborate with them. Well, how's that going? <laughs> So maybe we need a bit more maturity, but savvy around how do we navigate this? Not naively, because that would be tricky too, wouldn't it? If we blindly trusted some other organizations when we know what their agenda is to get as much sugar into our products as possible, then that would not be smart either. So we caught it in the central tension. So now I want you to think of another once upon a time story. This is a time where you attempted to collaborate with someone else and it just went to custard. It was awful. And it might be back at school. You remember those first projects when you were told, and you're going to do it as a team? And how many of you thought, oh no, team, God. I can count on myself, but mm. <laughs> So it might be from back then or it might be trusting a family member or trying to co-create a family event together, or it might be a workplace thing. Think of a time when you tried to work with someone else and it went to custard, one minute each, turn to a new neighbour though, okay, and tell a short story. Is it not a happy ending? Okay, that's a wrap. So what were some of your feelings about that then, but also even in talking about it now? Notice there was quite a bit of energy in talking about that just then. Yeah, there's still some feelings there. So raise your hand, I'll call on you. What were some of the feelings back then or even now? Frustrating. Frustrating. What else? Exhausting. Exhausting. What else? Lost opportunity. Lost opportunity. Disappointing. What else? Waste of time. What else? Got a good lesson. Got, got a good lesson. Got a good lesson. Never trust anyone ever again. <laughs> or another lesson. <laughs> Choose your bedfellows wisely. <laughs> so they are strong feelings. Do you carry some of those with you? That can easily become a filter through which we look at any future collaboration, can't it? because we've been impacted by that. Now we could either hold a lesson like, okay, I'm gonna do that more smartly next time, good, good insight, 
all make that binary decision, right, that's it, I can only ever count on myself, everyone else, dead to me. And that becomes the lens through which we look at future collaborations. So <laughs> next we're going to look at why collaborate, because it seems so tricky, doesn't it? We've got this, I don't want to be a traitor, <laughs> cooperating treacherously with the enemy. I've been burnt before in the past. Why on earth would I collaborate? So now you and three others, so groups of about four, I want you to tell me some key differences between baking a cake, parenting, and sending a rocket to the moon. Come up with a number of key differences. You've got 90 seconds. All right, what do you got? What's, what's a key difference between these three things? What are some ideas? Yeah? The number of the people who are involved in that three actions are increasing. Ah, number of people involved are increasing. Yeah, yeah, interesting, cool. What else have you got? Pardon? Increasing complexity, yes. Yep, cool, what else? Someone once said you really shouldn't send a child to the moon. You might send a cake. <laughs> the, um, there's, a, there's a clear outcome for two of them. Okay, so clearer outcome, shorter time frame. Yeah. yeah, which two? Cake in the moon. Cake in the moon is <laughs> clearer than parenting. Sometimes it feels like that, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, check this out. So you've got these two axes. One is close to certainty, one's far from certainty. And then the other is close to agreement about how things are done, how to approach it. Stakeholders tend to agree through to far from agreement. Where would you put baking a cake? Bottom left you're pointing to? Yeah. Yeah, generally there's agreement about how you bake a cake. There's a recipe, there's ingredients and... Pretty certain it's going to turn out. How many of you go, yeah, not when I bake it, though? <laughs> There's always, I'm with you, I don't bake. <laughs> and where would you put parenting? It's, yeah, you're pointing up there? Yeah? Why far from agreement? Well, let's just take a scenario. How many of you are parents, by the way? How many of you once were a child? <laughs> still, still hanging on? Okay, nice, okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, should you leave your child to cry themselves to sleep? Discuss. Is there disagreement? You will find a book either side times 200. What other topic of parenting do people disagree on? Sleep. Sleep. What? The lack of it? The importance of it? Oh, sleep when your child sleeps. How many of you feel like that would be like punishing me? I'd be, feel like I was sent to bed. I knew it, never was good at sleeping when my kids went to sleep. What else do people disagree about when it comes Screen to parenting? Time. Screen time. It's good for you. You need it to be a digital native versus no, it's bad for your brain. We're a tech-free house. It, so many numbers of things. You'll find people who consider themselves experts who have got degrees who will argue the case. Where do you put sending a rocket to the moon? Down here, yeah? It's complicated, but there is a way to do it. And there's general agreement in the scientific community about how to do it. And they use the same word similarly. Um, you know, I don't know what that word is, but there's a number of them. And they use it to mean the same thing. OK, that's it. That's all I've got on that one. <laughs> and what about things like the Sustainable Development Goals? or progress in public health, or you know, any one of the goals around reducing poverty, increasing inequalities. That's going to be here, isn't it? Because it's not necessarily all that certain how we get there, and a lot of stakeholders disagree. Now, no one's going to disagree. Is anyone, have you ever met anyone who disagrees that children are our future? Feed them well and let them lead the way. And that every child should have nutritious food in their belly. Everyone's going to agree with that, right? Where do we disagree is who pays for it. And that's usually the case with things like the Sustainable Development Goals and public health initiatives. Everyone agrees with the logic of it, but who should pay for that? And whose responsibility is it? That's where we come to conflict, which places it up there. What about things like natural disasters? 
that's kind of off the screen, isn't it? The chaotic. That's, uh, wow, we weren't even anticipating that. How do we respond? Now, there's a different leadership response needed for each of these challenges. So for simple, just tell people how to do it. There's all these cooking shows telling us how to do it. Can't be that hard, right? There's literally books with the recipe, just follow the recipe. With political, it seems to be more like sell. Sell your pitch and your advantages. With complicated, consult the experts. There are scientists who know a lot of answers here. With the complex, we need to co-create. And this is the kind of happy, good news, bad news. If you work in public health, and you all do, then you have to collaborate because the challenge demands it. If only the challenge were simple. Or if only it were just complicated, then we'd just consult the experts. How many of you have been working in nutrition for the last 30 years? Show of hands. Oh, aren't you gorgeous? 20 years? 10 years? Only recently born this century? <laughs> Welcome. I find it hard to imagine that you're in the workforce. It's a, no, I'm there. It's good. I love millennials. I have two of them. What's the problem with trying to treat complex challenges like they were simple? Well, I'm going to give you a challenge. So this half of the room over here, okay, your scenario is eight-year-old children are found smoking. What's the simple solution or the expert solution to that? Okay, so brainstorm just in twos or threes, we'll come back to some ideas. This half of the room, your challenging scenario is disengaged employees. Droopy skin bags off to work, <laughs> going through the motions. Only 24% of employees in New Zealand are engaged at work. That's a hell of a lot of wasted energy. It's also not good for people's health. What are the simple or just expert solutions to that scenario? Brainstorm amongst yourselves. I'll come back and interview each of you in two minutes. <laughs> All right, let's wrap that up there. So. Interview time, you're the experts, or you've got the recipe, what should we do? Children as young as eight are smoking. What should we do? What, what are some ideas? Raise your hand, I'll call on you. Education, awesome, who? Who should we educate? Everyone, awesome, cool. What else should we do? Leadership. Leadership from who? From the government, that, so the, in the form of what? Um, Smoke-free cars. Um, smoke-free cars. Uh, si smoke-free everywhere. Just kind of make smoking illegal, pretty much. Yes, cool. Back here. I find everyone's giving intelligent answers. We discussed just making smoking cats. Love it, <laughs> love it. That's like old school, you know. Make them smoke a whole packet until they're sick. Then they'll never want one again. Okay. Love it, love it. We need more lateral. Yes, here? <laughs> what? You mean actually ask why they're smoking and look at the environment and the context? That's not simple or complicated. That's sounding like co creating. That's beyond the brief. <laughs> but I think you were onto something. Yeah, very good. Is there any other kind of funny? A kick up the butt, yeah, of the smoke, not the person. Yes? Okay, nice. And now moving over to the disengaged employees. I mean, it's a crisis, it's an epidemic, only 24% of people are engaged. Do you know that those who are disengaged have every plan to come back tomorrow and keep complaining about it? Isn't that good news? They're coming back, okay? What should we do? What are our solutions? Yes, back here? A feedback box, oh yes, that'll be transformational. And maybe we'll even open it and read them. Oh, bless, okay, what else? You three were giggling away. You've got to tell us your one. There was something funny going on there. They couldn't possibly. No, okay, it was rude, all right. <laughs> <laughs> what else have you got? For dis A meeting with the team leader, that'll inspire, yes. Or performance appraisals, we love those. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Anything else? More coffee. More coffee, or more better coffee. Okay, awesome. Anything else? More pay. More pay, that'll be helpful for about that long, won't it? Yeah. 
So you get the picture. If we try and solve what is a complex problem by just simple or bring in the expert methods, we're not actually solving the problem. So the kind of good bad news for you working in this field is you have to collaborate. So now how? When you've got this risk of collaborating with the enemy and being seen as a traitor by some of your colleagues, how do you navigate this then? Well, let's look at who do you collaborate with? How do you work out who to work with? Well, this is when you need to do some stakeholder mapping. So who are the people in the system? If we're looking at children, say, zero to eight, they're a pretty good group to start with, how might you approach mapping all of those in the system around them? Well, you put them at the centre of your map. Some agencies I see do stakeholder mapping, put their own agency at the centre. Well, that's just like related to yourselves, like the sun around whom everyone else rotates. But you're never at the centre of anyone else's map. Have you noticed that? <laughs> so actually put the community group that you're trying to impact in the middle. And then ask, well, what are the key stakeholder roles around that? And you can do it on post-it notes, which is easy because you can move them. And then can you categorise those simply, simply into clusters? And can you move them from being core to direct to indirect in terms of their relationships? This is a really nice, quite simple method to get started. So here we go, let's model it. Here's a child, zero to eight. Well, here's some of the groups around them. So parents, family, whānau, community, care and education, health, social services and others. And then we might go, okay, so who do we place in core? Who do we place in direct? And who do we place in indirect? So from those prompts around the outside, who would you place as having a core relationship with a child zero to eight? Parents, right? And then you cluster other people and you end up with a really simple map. <laughs> really straightforward, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and right about now, you start getting really, really overwhelmed when you do mapping. Have any of you done mapping exercises before? And it, it, it's like, I feel like I've got the whole world in the room. How am I supposed to learn how to navigate that? Well, where do you go from there? Well, you start by looking at well, who connects with who and what's within our sphere of control or influence. So there's three circles in life. In the middle, there's things you can control. Who can you control? Yourself, somewhat, yes? <laughs> and then out from that, there's things you can influence. So who in your life can you influence? Your team, your team family, some colleagues, some, some workplace decision making, depending on your level of informal authority or formal authority. And then there's some things that go into the circle of concern. If only you could influence them, but you can't. What are some things in life these days that we can't influence, that you'd really like to? What the Australians vote for? How about that one? Yeah? Because I think that recent vote is not great for the climate. Any of you following Australian politics? Any of you, like, rather not? Um, or the orange man? Oh, this is being videoed. I just remembered that. OK. You know the orange man, I mean. I'm concerned about him. Can I influence him? No. Are there things that are happening in New Zealand that you're concerned about? And are some of them some things you can't influence? Where should we put our energies? <coughs> On things we can do something about, right? So start with ourselves, control, then our influence. And what we find if people do that, they actually expand their influence over time into bigger territories. So you will be expanding your accountabilities over time into things you once were concerned about but couldn't do anything about. So when you've got a map like this, you start by saying, OK, what in this map might we be able to influence? Or who could we influence to influence others? That's where it gets quite neat and sneaky. And you form a strategic influencing plan about who's got access to whom and how can you activate those levers to impact decision making for the greater good. So that's a piece on who. So you can see how come authors like this one, Adam, Kahan, say collaboration is becoming more necessary and more difficult. Good book, Collaborating with the Enemy. It's really helpful on how do you navigate when some of those relationships on the map 
are with people you've thought of traditionally as the enemy or against your agenda or cause. Now let's talk about trolls. Not media trolls, but trolls waiting under the bridge. There are trolls of collaboration and failing to anticipate the trolls has led to many a wounded heart. So we need to learn how to anticipate the trolls and navigate around them and plan for the likely breakdowns. So I want you to remember, do you remember the story of the three billy goats gruff? Yeah? So we find ourselves at one end of a bridge, using the metaphor, and we realise that our old ways of working just aren't cutting it. So all these separate organisations in health across New Zealand, all the compartmentalised ways of working, are they solving some of the key issues in New Zealand. They're actually making it harder, aren't they? There's certain drivers that make it very hard to coordinate across public health. So we realise our old ways of working in silos won't, won't solve the issue. And using the fairy tale, it looks like if we just cross this bridge, the grass is greener over there if we can collaborate together. But there are trolls. What are the trolls of collaboration? As you go to cross the collaboration bridge to the other side, what are the things that come out from the bridge and like to kill both billy goats and collaboration? Have a brainstorm with a neighbour, please. What are the trolls? What are the predictable, likely things that get in the way of collaborating? OK, let's take some examples. You don't have to tell the whole story, but just naming what's a likely troll. What are some likely trolls that come out from under the bridge? Yes. Legislation. Legislation. Change of legislation, changing the rules of the game. Yeah, OK, good. What else? So your context changes, doesn't it? It's like, I thought that, those were the goalposts. Now they're over here. Hidden agendas. Hidden agendas. Ministry contracts, which drive what in the system? Competition for funding. Yeah, competition is one of the key ones. How to anticipate that. Back here? Egos. Egos, yeah. People wanting to take credit or, yeah, or overvaluing their portion of the say. Yeah. So competition is one, I think, that is, um, seems to be driven into the system currently. And... So when you're compete, what are you competing for? Were you competing for resources, funding? What else are you competing for? Time, mana, yeah, <coughs> reputation, space, relationships, sound of voice, access to people. The commitment one's interesting. If we start out with a naive good intention walking across the bridge, what we can find is we did not anticipate the amount of time this was going to take. Wow. How many of you have been overwhelmed by that? It's like, I thought this was going to be straightforward. But no, it's meeting about the meeting we met about last meeting and then another meeting to just get started. And we're still talking about, shall we work together? So it takes a phenomenal amount of commitment. And sometimes you find the people you start across the bridge with aren't there halfway across the bridge. So are organisations, agencies, individuals really confronting the necessary commitment? Can you build in a pause at some milestones across the bridge and go, are we still into this? Are we still up for this? And are we the right people? And what about control? Collaboration requires us to let go of some of the power and control levers we might have been able to exercise previously. So if government and a community agency are wanting to work together to truly co-create, there's going to be a need to let go of a traditional master-servant kind of mindset or way of relating that might have been there in the past, or different ways of holding contracts and managing relationships will be required. That's navigating tricky territory. And what if the uh, other people in senior authority roles in those organisations aren't buying into this? So what are some of the likely, likely watch outs? Um, some of the things I've seen is realising that the starting group who initiate a collaboration very often aren't the group to implement the outcomes of the collaboration. 
And so you really need to allow for holding a team lightly at first across agencies, because what if they're not the right people to drive the change forward? It's very awkward to uninvite people from your book club. <laughs> and have you been in that situation where <laughs> she really doesn't fit, but we're still going three years later. <laughs> it, she doesn't really fit, and she doesn't read the books. So what are we going to do? So we've got choices to make, and I would like you to consider that collaboration's not the only answer. So sometimes, in my experience, people think, oh, we'll do it ourselves, or we'll go all the way to fully collaborate. Well, actually, there's some choices we can make in between that that might be perfectly good for our needs. What are the choices in between? I like this saying, collaboration isn't the only option, and in fact, my key message of this entire hour is don't collaborate. Don't do it unless you have to. And do you have to? Yes. Okay, <laughs> so do it. <laughs> but really don't do it, and don't do it naively because it takes a ton of energy and time. But is it necessary? Yes, it is. So go into it mindfully, savvily, um, with maturity, anticipating the likely breakdowns, rather than going into it naively and then adding it to the heap of disappointments of other people who've let you down. So what are the different relationship choices? Well, at the bottom, we've got networking. Networks can be perfectly good. Networks are about exchanging information for mutual benefit. So what networks are you part of that meet that criteria of, yeah, we exchange information and I get something out of it and they get something out of it. What networks are you part of in life? Have a chat to a neighbour. What are your networks? What are some networks you're part of? All right, and pause there. So what are some examples I heard? School, yeah? You've got some school networks? And what do you exchange for mutual benefit? Kids. <laughs> It's benefiting me that you have my son today. <laughs> and I'll have, you, I'll have yours next week, okay? Or exchanging information. Um, yeah, cool. Are there work networks that you're part of? A&A. A &A is a network, yeah? And you exchange information, you connect to people, you create events like this, which a lot of is about information, but also connections, yeah? Now, might something start as a network and then you actually see it's worthwhile and you go further up the ladder? That often happens, doesn't it? So coordinating is a level up from networking. It's where you, yes, exchange information, but you also alter your activities for a mutual purpose. So you're willing to alter your agency's or your group's activities for a purpose out here, and so do they. So can you think of some areas in which you coordinate with a different team or with a different agency around some common outcomes, yeah? And then a level up from that is cooperating. So that's exchanging information, yes. Altering activities, yes. But also sharing resources. Is this where it starts getting tricky? Oh, you mean we have to share resources? Yeah, we're gonna people this though. And it might need some funding. And it might need each of us to give up a bit of power. And then the higher we go up to collaborating, it's all of those things that have come before, but also committing to enhancing the capacity and capability of the other. So we're actually enhancing the other for mutual benefit. That takes letting go of a lot of our control <laughs> and a lot of our normal sense of power. So you have other choices. Might you be able to accomplish some of your public health goals through some of the things below collaborating on the ladder? I think you can. So perhaps it's thinking to yourself, okay, how could I enhance or expand my networks? What are the possible networks out there? Leadership can feel like a lonely enterprise when we're not connected with others. How might you meaningfully connect with others? With whom could I coordinate activities? Seems nuts to me, there's all these DHBs across the country, and it does occur to me as a provider in this world that there's very little coordination across them, for example. But this could coordinate across, just creating your own connections. Others in the world are trying to solve similar problems. How are they approaching it? How might I connect with them? The extraordinary thing in New Zealand is I find pretty much anyone will say yes if you say, can I take you out for coffee and have 20 minutes of your time? 
pretty much anyone. For, for sure that is the case in Wellington where I'm from. Is that your experience of people in this community? People are really willing to help, right? And connect you with others. So before committing to collaboration or even cooperating, here's some things to check. Is there an actual perceived need by both parties? Is there a goal that you have in mind, something that you want to accomplish? Is there shared understanding of that by both parties? Are people tr genuinely committed to it and seeing it right through to implementation, not just being part of a shiny ideas project? Are people willing to share things, ideas, resources, power? And do the perceived benefits outweigh the perceived costs? <clears throat> and I would recommend having a breakdown conversation near the beginning. What are all the likely breakdowns? What are the trolls that could come out from under the bridge? What, uh, what authority do you need in your agency to get this through? Do we ask for forgiveness or do we wait for permission? What do we do? What, what's, what are some of the risks that could happen if this all goes pear-shaped? And actually have that maturity conversation at the outset. And how should we navigate those then? And what's our code and way of working together? So then, we're nearly there. Lucky last, how the heck do we do it? If you've decided to do this, you've had those maturity conversations, how do we go about forming a collaboration? What's the architecture for designing collaborations and what are the skills that we need throughout? Well, there's two broad approaches, conventional and stretch. Conventional is where one agency gets only its people together and defines an issue or problem or dilemma and also defines the solution and then says, oh, can you come and collaborate with us to deliver X, which I've already designed? Have you come across that before? What's the pitfall of that approach? There's no co-design, right? So there's no ownership or engagement. Maybe the dilemma hasn't been framed as the community or user would frame it, and maybe people just don't buy into the solution. I still see a bunch of that happening across the country. Whereas stretch collaboration is actually, no, we're going to co-define the dilemma together. We need to get the system into the room or go to the room that they are in and do the co-design work, which is the hard mahi, isn't it? It's the listening keenly for. And the solution that comes from the community may well be different than our expert-led solution, but you know what? It's going to be so much more sticky because there's the ownership in it. One of the best models that I've come across for this kind of collaboration is Twyford's collaborative governance model. And there's great free resources online on how to do collaboration or sometimes they call it collective impact. If you do the full collective impact model, you may have heard about it before, they recommend forming a backbone organisation. In New Zealand, I find that impractical. I think agencying it from across your agencies is better than forming a separate agency. We just don't have the scale or resources often to form a whole new agency with its own bureaucracy to steer this issue. So I think you can modify the approach and be really pragmatic about it. Uh, a key feature of this model is bringing the people in the room and co-defining the dilemma and then committing to work together and taking real time with the whakawhanangatanga, the getting to know each other. What are our core values? What's shaped us? What's our stories that have shaped us that bring us into this place and have us care about this issue together? Taking time for personal storytelling is a, an investment of time that pays off hugely. Uh, a lot of Western-based organisations still get to the agenda. <laughs> what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? When are we going to do it by? And we need to pull that back and go, actually, who's here? Who's in this space? What attracts us to this issue? Um, how do we anticipate succession? If you're collaborating across agency boundaries is it, and there's only one of you from each agency, the most likely breakdown is someone's going to change jobs. There goes everything in that agency. You've got to start from nothing. So a really great tip for me is always have a shadow successor. So every person is briefing another person or two inside the organisation to take over their seat in the event that they change roles. I think that's a stunning idea. One of the most tricky situations, and here's where it comes from, it comes from a bad story. One of the trickiest situations I've been asked to collaborate was where I was asked by a ministry 
to fly to another centre and facilitate a governance group conversation for a day, the outcome of which the ministry wanted all of those governance group members to, to realise that they shouldn't be on the governance group. There's your brief. Go. Wow, right? I'm like, wow, thanks for that brief. That's awesome. <laughs> so that's really challenging. And that's because there was no plan for succession or change of membership. If you're forming a collaborative group, you should put in a review. Let's review our membership on criteria at six months intervals or year intervals max. Otherwise, how do you invite people off your book club? That was really, really challenging situation. And in fact, I don't think I should have been in that situation as an external facilitator. I think it, that was a conversation that the ministry should have been having, not asking me to have as an external facilitator. <laughs> it was challenging. So what are the skills needed to collaborate well? Here's a, ha here's a set of them. Uh, listening more than talking, really deeply listening to what are the motivators, what are the drivers, what are the needs, and remembering to put the user at the centre of this listening rather than your agency's agenda and their agency's agenda. Being able to have dialogue where you can hold difference and listen to difference without invalidating one another, where you can understand different perspectives and find a holding environment in which to hold them all. What's called adaptive leadership or leading in complexity, so understanding that different leadership approaches, which are more uh, intelligent, fast failure, more prototyping, experimenting, than having a grand strategy that you roll over time. So multiple experiments work better in this field than single big initiatives that take a 10-year funding cycle, because when do we get that? This concept of a holding environment is how do you have a container for having a conversation in which there's going to be conflict over time? How do you form that environment? And some simple practices like always having a check-in and a check-out in each of your gatherings. So checking in is a chance for people to arrive and connect to themselves, be present and to the purpose. And can be as simple as how are you and what are your hopes for this meeting? can be as simple as that. And at the end of it, some kind of checking out where people get to say how they are and what they're taking away. It's a knitting together of ourselves and our sacred space together. Skill for facilitation. Facilitation is something we sometimes acquire of a career, but it's something that's often underestimated. I get on a soapbox about death to boring meetings. Our country specialises in boring meetings. We do them really well. It's one of our talents. It could be a hidden sleep inducer. It's, I think it's our like our atomic weapon. Uh, people go to boring meetings and complain about the boring meetings, but go back again to the boring meeting and don't do anything about the boring meeting. There's, and a boring meeting is one that has no intention, no agenda. People aren't knitted together well on an intimacy relationship level. There doesn't seem to be a wide range of choices or options for guiding people to go from ideation to decision making. So if you're leading in this field, I think investing and developing your facilitation skill and practice is really, really important. And then the experimental mindset. Imagine if in New Zealand we brought jazz hands to failure. Wouldn't that be remarkable? If we had a whole session of a conference like this where you each were clamouring to come to the stage and say, oh, I've got to tell you guys, I tried this thing and it was atrocious. I mean, such a bomb and it was public. Isn't that awesome? And we all went, yeah, yeah. What a learning. Instead, in this country, we've got a really immature relationship to failure. We tend to collapse failing at something with being a failure and our ego comes into play. How can you know your way forward with these complex issues? It's impossible. So maybe we could take that off our shoulders and go, I'm going to try an experiment over here, and I'm going to try an experiment over here, and something will work. Better to have five experiments on the go, one of which is likely, than invest all your energy in one thing, that if it doesn't work out, it feels a bit of a tragedy to you. So collaboration and working in this way is much more like jazz than like an orchestral manoeuvre. Get the right players together, have a common intention, agree on the key, and then we need to learn to hold a space where we can trust each other to be fabulous and come forward. So who are these two guides that we've had 
in this conversation, my Batman and my Robin. Well, Batman is now 20 years old, and at the end of last month, he flew on a one-way ticket indefinitely to London in Europe. My heart on legs in the world. Whew. How many of you can relate? Got a young person away. <laughs> and my Robin is 18, and he's still at home. And someone told me recently this morning, um, be yourself, and I'd add, be yourself, everyone else is taken. But then he added, but if you have a chance to be Batman, do be Batman. <laughs> so <laughs> my final words is um, thank you so much. I salute you for the work that you do because you're doing really worthy, great work. And I appreciate that at times it's hard and it's much easier to retreat and try and work and solve problems on your own. Unfortunately, in this field, we don't get to do that. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Stay right there. Has anyone got any questions for Andrea? No? Well, I just do.